Well, it is the weekend, and as the weekend comes, so does Michael Snyder from Hollywood, California, where he talks all about the movies. Hello, Michael. Well, howdy, Alex, and uh, hi, listeners. Uh, we've got some movies to review, and uh, let's just start rolling, and we'll kick it off with Aladdin from Disney. It's a, a live-action retelling of the famous story of the boy who was a street rat and a thief in Agrabah in, uh, I guess, I don't know, ancient Arabia, and he uh, finds himself in the possession of a magic lamp. You know the story. And, of course, it was already done by Disney as a cartoon, a cartoon dated with topical references strewn through that film by the late Robin Williams, who voiced the manic blue-hued genie from The Lamp. Uh, this was an original animated musical based on the tale, but it wasn't a favorite of mine when it comes to Disney's um, recent animated output, despite a few lively tunes, including one mega-hit pop ballad, A Whole New World, and some fun gags and visual splendor. Your pal uh, Gilbert Gottfried voiced uh, the parrot, who was the hench person or hench creature of the villain Jafar, who wants to possess the lamp and take over the kingdom. Of course, there's a love interest, Jasmine. All this stuff is in the new movie, although Gilbert does not do the voice of the parrot. Uh, unintelligible, by the way, in this particular film. Why remake this movie as a live-action film? Uh, why indeed? Why did Disney do a live-action version of uh, their Beauty and the Beast musical? Which, by the way, was not half bad, although unnecessary. Why did they do the recent star-studded and muddled update of the classic Dumbo? There's a soon-to-be-released repurposing of The Lion King, a Disney 2D animated musical of somewhat recent vintage, redone as a uh, realistic right, right. computer we don't, we animated don't movie. Need, we don't need uh, history. Do we don't need history. Okay. Well, in the context of what we're talking about, well, we do, and I'll no, tell you why. You just just get, a, get on we with it. We have a situation where they are repurposing film after film well, we after know film. That. We know that. And I'm saying, why? Well, the money. And is this good? It's directed by, of all people, Guy Ritchie, best known for his shoot 'em ups his modern kind of crime comedies. Uh, and also the Sherlock films featuring Robert Downey Jr. And I guess Disney figured he could handle a big budget thing like Sherlock. Let's give him this. And yeah, this has some nice visuals. Uh, Will Smith as the genie brings a little bit of verve to the role. And uh, I guess Naomi Scott playing an empowered Jasmine is an interesting twist. She wants to be uh, the sultan after her father. She doesn't want to just be married off to another prince. And uh, there's a guy named Mina Masood who plays Aladdin. They all sing well. It just, I mean, the question is why? And the answer is purely money. Is it great? No. And it, it seems with the hip-hop rhythms to the new versions of the classic songs, they're pandering to the current audience, which is understandable, I guess, but it's also going to date this film, much like the animated film seems dated right now. I'm, I wasn't crazy about this. That's the ultimate here. I, You know, they're entitled to do this, to repurpose their properties, but I just don't think it's necessarily a good idea. I had more fun at Brightburn, although, again, not great. And talk about repurposing. The essential story of Brightburn is that a childless Kansas farm couple are yearning to have a kid and a spacecraft crash lands nearby their farmhouse and they discover an infant child in there and they decide to raise the kid as their own. That's right, it's the Superman story. It's updated to uh, modern day. Uh, it features Elizabeth Banks as, I guess, the Ma Kent in this movie. David Denman, who was Roy, Pam's former fiancé on The Office, plays the Pa Kent character. And um, eventually, coming to puberty, a young kid named Jackson A. Dunn plays Brandon, the child that they raise as their own. But the idea is, what if the kid was not heroic? What if the kid was evil and destructive? So it's a very simple concept and they uh, turn it into sort of a horror movie with the kid going bonkers as uh, his 
urges start to take a dark turn. Uh, David Yarnowski is the director, but in fact, the producer is James Gunn of uh, Guardian of the Galaxy's fame, uh, whose first major film, Slither, featured Elizabeth Banks, by the way. And the reason I think this was made was that Gunn was the producer, and his brother and his cousin wrote the screenplay. I don't know that it's all that great, uh, but it's interesting to see what they did with it. Again, there are some scares, but interestingly enough, in the press materials, no signs of the word Siegel, Schuster, or Superman, as if, well, yeah, we came up with this idea. Obviously, that's not the case. And uh, by Siegel and Schuster, I mean the creators of the Superman myth and uh, the character. Uh, I thought this was fun in a kind of Saturday matinee way. Uh, is it a great film? Again, no. A much, much better movie, and one that I can kind of heartily recommend, is the first directorial effort by Olivia Wilde, of all people. It's called Booksmart, and the easiest way to describe it is that it's super bad, with two studios, uh, studious nerd girls, Amy and Molly, instead of two guys, like the guys played by uh, Michael Sarah and Jonah Hill in uh, Superbad. And these uh, girls decide they need to get their party on as senior year is about to end and they're going to go on to college. It's definitely fun and a bit raunchy in the expected way, uh, but it's also kind of sweet and modern in what differentiates these two friends from their more fun-loving fellow students who are not stereotypical jocks and cheerleaders, but more contemporary woke types. And there are reasons why uh, Amy and Molly played, uh, well played, by the way, by uh, Caitlin Deaver and Beanie Feldstein, a couple of young actresses. Uh, Amy is, is a sort of closeted lesbian, but not really. Beanie is sort of a portly, uh, kind of fun-loving uh, young woman herself, but she's been repressed by her need to do all of this uh, kind of grind academic work. Um, and so they're kind of not accepted by the kids. Getting to the point uh, of getting out there and having a good time is fun. The, the party scenes are fun. And Olivia Wilde uh, directs this with a really a firm hand. And all the other kids in the, uh, in the cast are really, really solid. I enjoyed uh, – I, I, it was no – they're not breaking new ground, except that it's girls instead of boys. But I uh, enjoyed Book Smart. And we'll wrap up with Echo – in the Canyon, a documentary that I was really looking forward to. I had great expectations for this um, a documentary with vintage music and, and contemporary performances that I hope was going to be a deep dig into the groundbreaking folk rock and pop that grew out of the colony of young kind of hippy dippy musicians that lived and created in Los Angeles's Laurel Canyon neighborhood up in the hills above Hollywood in the mid to late 60s. And Echo in the Canyon does have some terrific archival footage and, and interviews, as well as latter-day testimonials from the scenesters who are kind of still with us. But those new interviews are done by Jacob Dylan, Bob's son and leader of the latter-day folk rock band The Wallflowers, and one of the producers of the movie. And the whole film begins to shift into a concert film about the younger Dylan doing a tribute album and concert covering songs from that sanctified era. And Jacob is not a great interviewer, and though he's a serviceable singer and he teams with some talented, really well-known peers on his Laurel Canyon recording project, uh, a great documentary about the era and the performer starts to look and sound suspiciously like a Jacob Dylan vanity project. Still, he does manage to uh, do, have footage with Eric Clapton, Stephen Stills, Roger McGuinn of the Birds, Michelle Phillips from the Mamas and Papas, David Crosby, Graham Nash, Jackson Brown. He obviously is connected to these people. He brings Beck and Nora Jones and Regina Spector into his project. I just... I wanted much more of the actual story. And it's odd that, say, Love and the Monkeys uh, and the Doors are not really much a part of this documentary. Anyway, there you go. That's it for me in terms of new films. What are you watching and doing? The only thing I'm watching, uh, the funniest piece of TV we have out there right now is uh, what we do in the shadows, uh, which is just heavenly funny. 
you know. Uh, yeah, the story uh, is spun out of a, a mockumentary about vampires living yes. in co- contemporary Wellington, New Zealand. They relocated to New York City. It is a hoot. I no, really no, like No, they it didn't well. relocate to New York City. These are different vampires than the ones they used in the movie. Well, uh, yeah, they they changed the setting to New York. Although, don't be don't be fooled because at least one of the characters from the original film does show up in the series. No, all of them do. Well, I said at least one. Yeah, all of them do. So so there you have yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, that's it. You can check me out on Twitter at uh, Culture Blaster and on Facebook at Michael Snyder's uh, Culture Blast page. That's all she wrote. Okay. And that's it for our uh, movie reviews. There's more Gabnet coming up if you're listening to us 24-7.